what you are basically. Deep, deep down, far, far in, is simply the fabric and structure of existence itself. Peace for all men and women, for all men and women, for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, peace in all time. Honestly expressing yourself. Peace for all men and women, for all men and women, for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, peace in all time. The fabric and structure of existence. Hi everybody, welcome to the Parallel on Mike podcast. This is episode number 62 and I've got a fantastic show to share with you today. We are joined by Sir Julian Rose. Julian is what you'd call landed gentry. He was born into British aristocracy. His father was a sir and Julian inherited the title and also a big massive estate down in the south. It's called Hardwick House with a thousand acres of farmland. Now what's really interesting about Julian is that he was never actually intended to inherit the estate. It was meant to go to his older brother but sadly there was a tragedy, his brother was killed in a motorcycle accident, then his father died, and then all of a sudden Julian, who had gone on a completely different path, he was traveling the world, he was living a bohemian lifestyle, he was involved in the arts and the theatre, he was all of a sudden called back to go and take on this massive farm. So essentially his life did a 180, he went back and he took over this farm, and Julian was a pioneer from the very beginning, he was one of the first people in England to turn their farm over to organic practices. So Julian was certainly a radical from the very beginning and he spent his entire life working to ensure that our environment and our food remains pure and good and healthy. He was actually also one of the people who managed to get GMO food banned in Poland. It was gonna get implemented here. He started a national campaign along with his wife and they eventually managed to get the entire country to say no to GMO and it's still the case today that there is no GMO seeds in Poland and it's because of him. So he's a fascinating man. He's written a number of books, including Overcoming the Robotic Mind, Why Humanity Must Come Through, and that's personally one of my favorite books. It's one that inspires me again and again. I've read it at least 10 times. So Julian is certainly one of my biggest inspirations over the past five years, ever since I found his work. And I am sure having heard tonight's episode, you will see why. In part one, we go into Julian's backstory. We talk about how he became the man he is today. And then in part two for members, we speak about his spirituality and how that developed over the course of his lifetime. And we also talk about solutions, including why we all should be building our art to survive the hard times times ahead and this is one of Julian's own personal philosophies it's something that he has helped me understand I actually spoke to Julian before I got my farm a number of years ago and he gave me some great advice so listeners you are going to love this one members please head over to parallelmite.com sign in to listen to the full episode if you're not a member yet please consider joining us in closing I hope you're all well healthy and reasonably happy and like always I'll see you in the next one Hi everybody, welcome to the Parallel Might podcast. Today we are joined by a very special guest. His name is Sir Julian Rose. He is an author, a farmer, and a pioneer of the organic movement. Julian has also spent his life in service to humanity through his activism aimed at keeping our planet and food free from toxins. So Julian, welcome to the show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. I'm a huge fan of your work. I've got all of your books and I'm really excited to share your voice with my listeners. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Mike. I'm delighted to be able to participate. Well, I'd love to start, Julian, by maybe allowing you to speak a little bit about how you came to farming, because your life path was on a very different trajectory, as was mine. I never planned to be on a homestead. I was a social worker, and I know you was involved in the arts. And this is going back to, I think it's the 70s, but forgive me if I'm wrong. And you at some point had a sudden shift. So that might be an interesting story to share with listeners, because I think a lot of people who listen to my show are in the early stages of going back to the land or thinking about going back to it. And you're the perfect person to share that transition. So I'll hand it over to you. Well, yes, indeed. I have had a very, a very diverse and, and some people might even say contradictory series of experiences in my life, which... Ultimately, when you look back on them, you can see how they all connect. Uh, but at the time, 
they seem to be jumps from one state to another state to another state to another state. And the, the reason why I take these jumps is entirely through following intuition. And they don't seem logical at the time of doing them. Now, the issue to do with the land is very, very central in my life because I inherited a country estate. Really, I shouldn't have, but my elder brother was killed in a motor racing accident when I was 16 years old. And my father died of a stroke about four years later at the age of 53. And therefore, I inherited uh, a country estate and a title, baronetcy, at a time when I was really feeling very overwhelmed by that that concept and that uh, level of responsibility. I didn't have the experience. I didn't have the awareness. I didn't have the skills. I didn't have any qualities which would have put me in a strong position to take over a family estate. But I had a mother who was very thoughtful, wise, and uh, loving. And she was pretty much in charge of, of many of the aspects of estate affairs because my father had been unwell for quite a long time. And my mother really took over much of the practical duties and was very capable, actually. Of course, uh, we're talking about a thousand acre estate with about 30 cottages and very old Elizabethan house where we grew up as children, four of us, five of us originally. Uh, and the overall, so to speak, family, which an estate is, was very traditional. So, in fact, what happened was, aged 18, when I left my, sec my secondary school, I went to Australia. I wanted to get away from the UK, and I wanted to get away from the, my, my background. I wanted to see how I could manage in the world on my own, as it were. I'd been to boys' private schools in England, which was a pretty a scary experience, and I had quite enough of anything to do with education, in quotes. <laughs> so I wasn't keen to go to university. So I wanted to explore the world. I won't go into this in detail because <clears throat> it's too long a story, really. But I did go to Australia, and I remember it cost £60 in 1964. And it was on a, a, a Greek ship where most of the people sat on the deck, Greek uh, emigres sat on the deck for five weeks, <laughs> munching on the Greek foods and swilling their vodkas, etc. So it was pretty crazy. On arrival there, I found work. Uh, and I worked for the Australian Broadcasting Commission for a little while. And that opened my eyes to television. I was always very interested in acting and um, production side, actually, too, equally, equally so. I'd been an actor when I was at school. I was, so to speak, discovered at school as being potentially an actor. And then I worked on a very large estate in Queensland um, called Canobi. And it was about the size of Wales, one estate. It had 30,000 uh, beef cattle on it. And I was a cowboy and um, joined the other Australian cowboys in driving these cattle from waterhole to waterhole and uh, living the life uh, of the cowboy. But the most interesting part of this experience was meeting the Aboriginal people who worked on this farm and who taught me something very special a love of the land, a respect for survival on the land, a wonderful sense of humor, extraordinary uh, indigenous cultural background and knowledge, and terrible mistreatment by the white uh, class, management class who employed these people. However, he was, they were mistreated even while I was working on this uh, outback farm. They were mistreated by the boss, the Australian boss. And one day they all left 
they warned him that they would unless he changed his ways. And he just told them, you know, shut up and get on with the job, mate. And they decided that that was enough. And they pushed off into the, into the outback and were never seen again. Um, after I came back from Australia, I was still interested in possibly establishing a career in theatre. And so I, I applied to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London to become a stage manager, which is one way in, really. Uh, and I I did take this course for, for just over a year, stage management course, and then I got involved in acting and stage management work in local repertory companies in England for about seven or eight months after this experience. We've got up to about 1969, 1970 by now. Uh, I left again England after breaking up with a, with a girlfriend and I went to America where I traveled extensively, often on the Greyhound bus system, which in those days was 100 days for $100. <laughs> That's funny. So you could go anywhere you like for $100. It was amazing. I landed up in Los Angeles, hitchhiked to San Francisco, and stayed there at the end of the hippie era, really, uh, working in a restaurant as a waiter. And I had a colleague who joined an experimental theatre company, funnily enough, an American one, back in England. And he kept saying to me, Julian, you must meet these people. You will want to, you will definitely want to be, this is the sort of theatre that you would really like to be involved in. I'm not sure about myself. Maybe I'm not quite ready for it, but you must meet these people. So they came to America and I went and met them in Boston, USA. And they asked me to join them in this theatre company. It was called the Players Theatre of New England. And I subsequently did that. And that started my really serious interest in developing as an actor and as an assistant director and in many respects into holistic thinking because this experimental theater work was based on joining up different issues which are previously seen as separate including educational approaches working with children in drama uh, with classical music and with academic studies uh, and seeing how extraordinary flourishing results came out of this, which completely contradicted the traditional educational approach. Um, that happened after this company that I joined in America moved back to Europe, uh, where they established themselves in Antwerp in Belgium. I worked for 10 years there with this theater company in Antwerp in Belgium. And by about the fifth year when I was there, 1975, a lecturer came from an organization in England called the Soil Association. And there were posters up in Antwerp about it. It was pretty unusual, very unusual. But I thought, now this is interesting. I wonder what this is going to be. And I went and it was about something called organic farming. And I attended the lecture and I listened very, very carefully and was very, very moved by it because I felt in my gut, this is what I'm supposed to do with my estate. And when I went back to England, I said to my mother, I'd been attending this seminar in, um, in Antwerp. And basically they're saying that we can run this uh, farm without using agrochemicals, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, nitrate fertilizers. We can follow a route which was practiced pretty much traditionally up until the 1930s or up until the Second World War of rotational agriculture, uh, mixed lays, herbs, grasses, um, wildflowers, and we can have a commercial system producing organic food. I remember my mother very clearly. She said, oh, I'm so glad, darling. I hate those chemicals. <laughs> so that started me off so I, it's a long story I had to give a sort of brief background how I got there because you see what I mean by jumping between different things but that's where it landed me up 
And I came from being involved in very far going, very philosophical, actually, uh, experimental theater work where we were looking at connecting the expression, human expression, really, voice, movement, music, and text, and working with how when you combine these, you can bring out in the human being a quality of our deeper selves, our pride as human beings, our ability to be artists and to, to set a pattern of something positive on the planet, rather than just the traditional approach in theatre, which is to be like a mirror of the existing society, which in fact does very little to inspire people other than the fact that they may be excited and they may be moved, they may be made to laugh or made to cry. But we wanted to go further. We wanted to show that the human being is a powerful force for the better. But this needs to be expressed through the arts and with certain disciplines being at the bottom of them. So from there, I went into organic farming. Now, big jump. But fascinatingly, the undertext of organic farming is the connection between soil, plant, animal, and man. And the fact that there's a link, a permanent uh, dynamic link, if you like, cycle between these four elements, that if you break any one of them, the other three will be affected. So unless you have healthy food for the animals to eat and healthy uh, food, so to speak, for the humans to eat, unless that cycle goes right the way through and returns to the soil again, you have a problem. You've broken the, the cycle, the life cycle, and you introduce monoculture. You introduce the idea that you can bypass that longer term approach, that rotational approach, uh, and you can use chemicals to do that. You can break the cycle by using chemicals. You can break the cycle by using nitrate fertilizer instead of by using farmyard manure and clovers, which fix nitrogen, and beans, which fix nitrogen naturally. And you can break all these rules and you can go much faster and you can grow more voluminous crops. But what is the quality of the end product? And what is the quality of the land by the time you finish this process? How much fertility is left in the soil? How much vitamins, nutrients are left in the food we eat that breaks the cycle, the natural cycle, by using agrochemical process? This is, the, this is what I learned as I became a practitioner of organic farming. And I was hands-on. I had to do everything myself. That's my nature. I'm a very physical being, and I love working outside. And I knew that I needed to learn really from the from the bottom up if I was to be able to take on other people and be able, be able to direct them in this very new arena called organic farming. Now, it turned out that in the end, when I was certified by the Soil Association, and when my, my farm was certified by the Soil Association, I was the fourth organic farmer in England. <laughs> so that was in 1975. So you see, I've been a pioneer of organic farming, and it's been a very exciting project. And during that project, I've had tremendous problems, and I've had tremendous opposite. I've had wonderful results. And, but all the time, I've been learning, 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 learning. And um, that's taken me right through to the year 2000, when I um, felt that I needed to change. Um, I needed to move on in some form or other. And at that point in time, I met a Polish lady called Jadwiga Wopata, who was working for an organization called Ashoka at the time, which is... Per an organization which helps sponsor entrepreneurs in positive acts in general on the planet. And she was giving a lecture along with other Ashoka fellows, as they call them in London. And I was invited to attend by a colleague. And I met Jadwiga there. And she invited me to come to Poland for a meeting they were having later that year to establish an organization called the International Coalition to protect the Polish countryside. And I said, yes, I'd love to come. I'm fascinated by Poland. 
I'm particularly fascinated by the survival of all the small peasant farmers. How do they do it? You know, that's, in my view, the future of the planet. And I, I want to come and, and learn from how they achieve this, this process. And so I was invited and I came to this meeting. And it wasn't long before Yad Vega had invited me to be a board member of this organization. And it wasn't long after that before I was invited to be co-director and president of the International Coalition to Protect the Polish Countryside. So that brings us pretty much up to date, because for the last 20 odd years, returning frequently to England, especially to start with, um, I have been involved in helping to try and support the small farmers in Poland. And to uh, we have our own small farm here of about two hectares of land, and I'm still involved in uh, working the land with Jadwiga. Um, mostly growing vegetables now, whereas I was involved on a much bigger scale at Hardwick, which is the name of the estate that I inherited. Of course, uh, proper large scale farm, but very mixed. Um, we had at Hardwick, we had almost every conceivable enterprise you can imagine. But it started off with three dairy cows, Millie, Bugle and Valley. And um, I started an unpasteurized milk round with them <laughs> in around about 1980. And from there, I built up into having the free range hens and adding uh, free range eggs to my milk round and then pigs and adding pork to my milk round. And then it expanded, expanded, expanded. And of course, I had to start taking on extra help. And eventually we grew into a larger dairy herd, around 60, mostly Guernsey cows, selling unpasteurized milk locally, mostly locally, organic unpasteurized milk, and also selling to cheese makers in the area. And then in 1989, the government decided it was going to ban unpasteurized milk, dangerous to health. You know, the big marketing corporations and the milk marketing board and the, and the big boys in the dairy industry were quite worried that unpasteurized milk on a small scale and local sales was getting too popular. But they had to find a reason for why it wasn't safe to drink milk that hadn't been pasteurized. And so they found a very bad reason, actually, which was they accused some cheese coming from Switzerland called Brie de More, which is unpasteurized cow's milk cheese, of being imported into England and being eaten by someone who got very sick and almost died. And that was enough reason to ban unpasteurized milk. So I suddenly found myself being urged by some voice from a higher region to start a campaign to try and save it. And with a colleague uh, who was a food writer at the time, he and I got together and we put up a campaign. And in three months, we won. It's, it's a whole other story. You know, it's another program. <laughs> we can't get into that one. But it was very remarkable. So I got very involved in in um, television and radio. I was constantly on the BBC and, and on news nights and all these different broadcasting, telling the reason why unpasteurized milk was actually much better for you than pasteurized and film crews coming up to my farm and filming. And it was an absolutely extraordinary experience. And it lasted for three months and the government gave in. Partly because the Queen turned out to only drink unpasteurized milk. And it was uh, embarrassing, the idea that she might have her royal pinter banned. But uh, there, were of, there, were, there were bigger reasons than that behind it, too. I never knew this. The Queen only drank raw milk. I, well, I know that the Queen had a homeopath. And I know that yes. Prince Charles, now King Charles, only eats organic. And he has a homeopath. So I know that they're all about natural health. And they understand what's poisonous and what isn't. <laughs> but that they swear, that, that that this actually came out during your milk campaign is absolutely fascinating. I never knew that at all. <laughs> yes, it happened again in 1980, 1997. They attempted again to put through a ban. And again, we had to revive the whole thing. And again, we beat them back. And, um, you know, I, I, I found myself hobnobbing with ministers of agriculture. And um, I was even invited to number 10 Downing Street by Mrs. Thatcher at one point. So I became rather a, a sort of personality in association with uh, with farming. It was a bit of a it was a bit of a detour from the purely organic, 
But on the other hand, I recognized that it would be foolish to become purist organic, because in that way, you cut out a lot of people who are traditionally very good farmers, only use maybe a very few chemicals and would be good candidates to be organic in the future. So I've never thought of myself as being someone who's a stickler for every single rule and regulation that goes with organic farming. Uh, so here we are today, where I'm spending much time in Poland, and only go back to England pretty occasionally. And my farm in England is now moving on, the estate actually, is going to be turned into a land-based collective within the next two years. I will no longer be the owner. And this is pr pretty progressive thinking. Uh, largely my daughter and my son, who are my daughter is now 40 years old and my son is 38 and they want it to go in that direction. They don't want the responsibility on their shoulders of trying to manage it. They want to share that responsibility with people who live and work there. And on the other hand, we also have a massive tax problem. When I die, capital gain tax and inheritance tax problem, uh, and the estate would then have to be broken up in order to pay them. And so the long experiment, which I've partly described, would have been finished, actually, under those circumstances. So that's another, that's just ahead, round the corner, is the collectivization. And I think it will be a, a fairly un, an unusual situation for the UK that an aristocrat who owns a country estate decides to turn it into a collective. So, you know, there's a lot going on in my life. I don't think it's the first unusual thing you've done, Julian. <laughs> it, might, it might be the last unusual thing you do, but it's yes. not the first. <laughs> okay, let's go back just a little bit because there's so much that you just gave. And I think we could do about 10 episodes based on just what you've said. Yes, I know. That's uh, why I had that's, to rush But that's it. the point, right? You've had a very interesting life and I think you've got so much to offer. And I think if listeners just took the time to read your book, my favorite book, overcoming the robotic mind. I actually take it with me whenever I go on holiday because it's a continual source or wellspring of inspiration for me. So listeners, please go read Julian's book if you want to really get into some of these philosophical ideas that we're going to be discussing tonight. So let's go back to the start, Julian. When you made that transition from acting and doing theatre and drama and the arts, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a role that you didn't prepare for, you didn't expect to be the inheritor because you had an older brother, and for listeners that don't know the British system, basically it's the eldest son or the firstborn son, should I say, who gets the farm. So you expected to be the one that had the freedom to go out and do what you wanted. You didn't have the responsibility. But when you did make that transition, did you find that there was anything you was able to take with you from that life that you had before that allowed you to excel in a way that you otherwise wouldn't have? Because you mentioned you had this different theory around how to do the organic farming that you actually literally took from your acting background, which I find really interesting. So was there anything else that you took with you in terms of skills or knowledge? Yes, um, I had, I think probably the most important thing I took was self-confidence as a speaker, as someone who could stand up and express themselves, you know, and, and, and that is absolutely critical for, for us. That's why drama or some sort of amateur work in this field is is very valuable for a lot of people because it's very scary to start with when you're on a public platform you're put on a public platform and and you know and you want to speak about something and you don't feel confident in yourself as a, as a person to be able to do that so one of the tr ways of training yourself to be confident to do it is through working out what it is in yourself that you want to express in life as a whole. And that gets into very deep subject matter. That gets into the matter of what you really care about, what you really believe in, what you feel you might be equipped to be able to express uh, if you had the right sort of training or background to do that. Uh, and where you want to go with your life in terms of your own health belief how to expand your self-belief in a positive and exciting way. Because actually, the point about so much of life when you're young is that 
you want to be excited. You know, you don't want to get caught up in some nine to five job where you've got just to earn a living. You have to do miserable stuff day in, day out, day in, day out, and gradually say to yourself, oh, well, huh, and I guess I have to do this. That's what everyone else does. I guess I have to earn a living in order to be able to do and do and do. You know, you want to break out of that mold and follow your intuition. But this issue of intuition is the second point, I think, to answer your question. I had developed, I found myself to be well equipped with a, with a strong intuition. I can only thank the divine for that. And all my life, from a child onwards, I've been following this. It's like a, a bright star in the sky, whatever else is going on. I go back into my intuition and I question it to get the right answer. Am I doing the right thing or not? So developing one's intuition, developing the ability to have self-confidence, to speak clearly and well, and to have always that sense that life is a bigger picture than most people describe it as. It's potentially omnipotent. It's vast. Anything might happen. And you have to be open for this. You have to be open for any possibility, uh, rather than getting ca caught up in a fixed regime where you mark out each stage you want to get to and then try and follow it through. And this is where we, 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 we fall down, because our intuition then gets buried. We follow the status quo. And we usually become unhappy. So I think those two points would be issues I carried through from my experience in the in the experimental theater into my work in in the in on the land, and also the fact that it was very physical. Um, the, the the drama work we did was extremely physical. When I first started, typically there were five or six actors. Uh, we we did adaptations of works of famous works of literature which were adapted by the director. And while it was, I was in America, Richard was starting with this, and we did one famous American legend called The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by a writer called Washington Irving. And it's a great story. It's a, it's a sort of exciting, almost like a ghost story set in up in New York. And the actors, without changing, without any costumes and without any props, play all the parts. That is, you can be playing a tree, a wind, a storm, a character moving through that storm, a schoolmaster, a horse. You, and so you bring the whole drama to life in front of the audience's eyes uh, by being highly adapted. So in the process of doing it, you have to discover what it feels like to be a tree. You have to discover what it feels like to be a bird. Feels like. You know, I'm not saying imitating a bird. It feels like in your gut to be flying. Feels like then to be an actual character in the story who has a particular characteristics and all the rest of it. So that was, and it was very, very physical, fast moving, lasted about three quarters of an hour to one hour. And I loved it. And I felt in my element in this sort of world. So you can see when I got onto the land, I've been very, very busy with all these different uh, units that we have on the land and, and very actively involved in all of them, hands-on in every respect, I was in a certain sense simply continuing this mode of, <laughs> of operation of physically expressing myself, mentally expressing myself and beginning spiritually. That's wonderful. And I can totally see how that would translate because in our experience, since we got our farm and we've been working here day in, day out, it's an extremely creative process. It's an extremely creative process. You're working within all of these cycles and there's so many variables that come into play and so many unexpected challenges that arise that you have to be adaptable and you have to embrace all of it. If some moles come and they eat my vegetables, if some pests get into the greenhouse, whatever it is, you just have to accept it and roll with it. But today, if you look at farming, you wouldn't actually see it as something that's organic, involving these cycles. What you'd see it as is very formulaic. It is monoculture. It's putting chemicals into the process and trying to make everything systematic. So it's step by step by step. And it takes out the human creativity and it takes out the passion. So I can totally see why you didn't go down that path. <laughs> 
<laughs> why, why you became a pioneer of the organic movement because that totally suits your nature as somebody who wants to be a part of something real not something artificial but these people that we oppose julian they began with farming they began with our food and now it's moving on to us and you talk about this a lot you actually warn people about transhumanism when you wrote your book today it's well well underway especially since 2020 now i don't want to dwell too much on the negative but i do think it's important that we get your take on laying out where we act where we actually are in history what's happening right now and what threat do you think we're actually facing? How high is that threat level right now? Well, really, this is the, this is the absolute issue of the moment. Um, and of course, the reason why I I, I wrote this book, uh, it's a series of essays, um, is because I could see very clearly already 10 or 15 years ago that if I pursued this abstract, selfish, individualistic, uh, and godless, I'm afraid to say, root in society, it would lead to the denaturing of our own DNA. Actually, to put it in a simple term, the denaturing of our souls now, if you feel very closely con connected with nature, which of course I I was fortunate to grow up in a very beautiful part of England on my farm, and I got very I felt very close to nature. If you feel close to nature, you you feel absolutely appalled by this concept that you can control every aspect of nature, that you tell it what to do rather than listening to what it has to tell you to do. Or suggested that you could do to support it. So this this book sort of came out of me as a rallying call to people to hold on to their deeper selves in face of a massive attack on our value system, which has been fought for over hundreds of years by exceptional individuals with great courage, our freedoms, if you like. Um, under often under great duress. So we're very lucky, our generation, to have grown up at a time when some of the things that were happening in the 17th, 16th and 15th century had been ironed out to a certain degree. Uh, we have some sort of quasi-democracy and some things like hanging people on the streets and the, or so on had been banned. So people easily forget what the quali what quality of life really means and how what freedom really means freedom actually means taking responsibility not moving away from responsibility you know it's completely the wrong way around freedom is to take responsibility for one's life and for the future and for the planet that's the meaning of the word whereas we've been recently in the last 20 or 30 years we've been asked by the status quo by the cult, by the cabal that runs the planet, to believe that freedom means doing whatever you want at anyone else's cost, and it just simply doesn't matter. And of course, they have a plan behind this. The plan is to dehumanize humanity to the degree to which its DNA could be altered. Uh, we could be uh, basically through surveillance systems, through IT and, and other modern, most modern cutting edge technological advances in the worlds of EMF, electromagnetic frequencies, radiation frequencies, surveillance equipment, um, every aspect of news media that drills into people a certain view on life and expects them to uphold that view. Uh, combining all these together, you can see quite clearly how the plan for the future of humanity is to change us irrevocably into a species that can be controlled 100%. Now, that means cyborgian, cyborg, robot. And it, now people should be able to see this. Okay, unfortunately, the great majority still can't. 
in my view, it's very late in the day. I could see it a long time ago. But people must see that what is being planned for the planet, for themselves, for their children and for their grandchildren is the end of love, beauty, passion, um, appreciation, of beautiful music, of, of, of friendship, warmth, all the things that we characterize as being making life worth living. All those are being put in a pot and discarded in favor of a soulless, materialistic, robotic future. And the most central organizations behind this are global institutions, because it's a globalist regime, and you have at the top of that, I would put the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, and the World Health Organization. But then you've also got, you know, obviously the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and all the vast banking institutions which are funding all this stuff. But if you go to the uh, WEF, the World Economic Forum, you have you will find Klaus Schwab, who's the uh, director and chairman of that organization simply telling people what their future is going to be. And it's called the Fourth Industrial Revolution for good reason. <laughs> Industrial Revolution, Green New Deal, and the Great Reset. Actually, it comes under the heading, the Great Reset, and then you have the Fourth Industrial Re Revolution, Green New Deal. And Green New Deal is not green and not a deal. It's extremely dark, and it's exactly what I've just been describing. It takes green issues, of which the most predominant one being forced on humanity is the idea that the world is, is, is warming, global warming, and it's anthropogenic global warming, in other words, we're causing this. It takes that as the fundamental worst-case scenario <clears throat> and makes everything else adapt to that. So under Green New Deal, Sounds like, oh, nice, you're going to have the environment being helped. <clears throat> you're going to have windmills, wind farms, of, uh, and we're going to have photovoltaic panels, and you're going to have away from oil and fossil fuels, and we'll be moving into the green world that everyone once dreamt about. But when you explore it, just under the surface, you find that this is one massive lie. It's not green. Uh, it, it, is, it, it is the process whereby one paints a picture of something nice, but introduces underneath it the solution to dehumanizing mankind and making us into robots. Now, the most <clears throat> obvious example, perhaps, of this, and it's humorous in a way, is that part of the Green New Deal uh, evolutionary process, as prescribed by the World Economic Forum, is to remove animal life from farming particularly cows, sheep. Now, why would that be? Why would you have to have animals removed from the farm? Well, animals, cows, when they are digesting grass, <clears throat> they have two stomachs. And the process of digesting grass, they ferment this grass and they release some of that as methane. And so, the, government, so the, 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 the Green New Deal people say, well, there's methane. That's one of the key characteristics of what's causing global warming, <clears throat> along with CO2, which is the main one. Oh, really? CO2? So you think, well, what is CO2? Carbon dioxide. Why is carbon dioxide being demonized? Why is carbon dioxide, which is what plants need to live and to create oxygen, so that we can breathe <laughs> and other plants and animals can breathe. Why is that being demonized? And why are cows, for instance, being demonized? Because they give off a little bit of methane. And why? who's coming to the conclusion that this is causing a catastrophe on the planet, which is going to cause massive global warming and destroy everything unless we can get it under control by 2050? Who has invented all this stuff? And the more you look into it, the more dark it gets. You know, that's another program. You, you can probably find plenty of people who can tell that story. But essentially, the, the 
issue here is that the farming factor is critical. And that's why it's being so heavily attacked. They want to change our diet to a synthetic diet. They want us to live on entirely synthetic foods, foods which are made in laboratory, petro dishes, and which contain some animal tissue, and then all sorts of chemical deviants and, and bits and pieces, which string it all together with DNA and create something that looks like a piece of meat and with dairy products exactly the same. So the idea is to phase out farming altogether and replace that with this diet, synthetic diet, which will, of course, be a way of controlling humanity. Uh, as um, Kitzinger once said, those who control the food chain control the people. So there we are, the central issue, the robotic issue. So overcoming the robotic mind. And then the second part of the title, why humanity must come through, is critical. Because then we have to say to ourselves, well, what will it take for us to overcome all this nonsense? And what will it take for humanity to be able to really come through? And then you get into the spiritual. You get into the spiritual simply because if you believe that we are beings who come from one original creator, some creative force, let's put it that way, then you believe that we have some qualities, some potentials, some abilities to express which are being blocked. And if you believe your potentiality is being blocked, then you will recognize that what is being blocked is more vital than ever, because actually it's the only thing that can overcome the darkness. It's only that beautiful creativity, this God-given power that we have and which we don't use it, that is the only force capable of overcoming the satanic force that I've described. And it is satanic, believe me. It's psychopathic people at the top end of the pyramid, and it's satanic. So, you know, they are worshipping a dark god, and we are worshipping a light god. So the battle lines are being drawn, as I speak, between good and evil. And one has to make up one's mind which one side one is on. That is why um, the first chapter in my book is called, I think of it in Polish, Robi Zabuzno, The Hour is Late. And in that first chapter, people will find that challenge being presented by me, uh, which is critical. And I really shake people up. I, put it, I decided to put it as a front chapter in order to shake people up. Because I think if you can get through that chapter, you'll certainly enjoy the rest of the book. <laughs> but if you can't get through it, you may as well put it, put it down or give it to a friend. Well, that, that's one of the reasons why I really love the book is that it is aimed at challenging people to step up. It says in the first chapter that you must take action here. You are a participant in this and not taking action, in my opinion, is a vote for evil. There is no middle ground. I think you write in your book, the fence has been torn down or bent down. There is no fence to stand on anymore. You have to pick a side. And I love that line. <laughs> and, I, and I completely agree. And that's what I tell people through my work is that we have to we have to speak out and we have to take action now because the hour is definitely late. We've had generations of people who have been lulled into a fantasy of dependence where you can live completely dependent on the state and there's no consequences and of course we're seeing the consequences coming like a tidal wave now and it's going to be complete subjugation of mankind and nature in every form and every possibility and like you said there will be no love there will be no having babies there will be no having children every single part of the process of living will be controlled from birth to death and it will be an early death because they will kill you when they're done with you uh, if they don't have any use for you, you will never be born to begin with. There'll be no choice. And it's an awful satanic vision of the future. So, like you said, the battle lines are being drawn and we are taking our sides. But therein lies something that's very beautiful that I've noticed the past few years, Julian. And I'd love to get your take on this in that I've seen a profound, I would say a profound energy at work in the world. People of the right 
nature and of the right energy are being drawn together at a rate that I've never seen before. People are finding each other by all kinds of strange coincidences or synchronicities. Yes. And we're falling into each other's lives. And all of a sudden, we've got a new kind of team that's being drawn together of very aware and awake people. They're finding each other and they're trying to create solutions, communities, uh, ways of moving forward that are going to see us through the hardest part of this. And then hopefully, when that system perishes and crumbles, the communities will already exist and will then take over. And I, I truly believe in my heart that will happen. But I think we've got some rough years ahead in between now and then, and it's going to be very trying and testing. And you you certainly need uh, a creator and a spiritual goodness in your life. Otherwise, you're not going to survive it. And in fact, if you don't have that, I don't see what the point is in even trying to fight back. If You may as well just go along with, with it. If you don't believe there's something better, just go along with it. But I think everyone listening to this does believe that. So before we go into part two, Julian, where we are going to discuss the spiritual side in much more detail, I just wanted to ask your opinion for listeners that are out there they're still living their old life, but they know what's happening and they've connected with their heart and they believe that they need to start taking care of themselves and build the ark to survive the storms ahead. I know it sounds simple, but where do you start? Where do you start? How do you give up on the ties to the old world, the ties to the material world and take that courageous step into leaving that system behind and going into the unknown, being creative once more, going back to the land and having to create a whole new economics for you and your family, because that's a key part of it too, is giving up the careers. I mean, I had a career in the UK and I left it behind. I was advanced in that career. And then I reset myself in a country where there is uh, no way I could continue my career. I, did, I didn't even know the language. So you have to be brave. You have to be courageous. How, how would you advise listeners start on that before we end part one? Well, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of people who are who would like to know the answer. That, and I certainly don't have it. So that's the first thing to say, because <laughs> I didn't follow that route. I decided to follow my intuition. Now, you might then say, how do people learn to listen to their intuition? I think this is probably the first step, because you've got to have a guider. You've got to be guided. You don't just take an arbitrary step into the unknown. You've got to have a voice inside you that is asking you to do it. But all of us have that. All of us have that. But it's buried. And it's buried under layers and layers and layers and layers of things we believe in because of the propaganda that we've been living with and that's been enforced upon us. And because we're addicted to habitual uh, habits, all of which are about not allowing that intuition to come out. And I'm talking about watching television excessive use of mobile phones, eating the wrong food, drinking alcohol, etc., etc., etc. All these, unfortunately, are simply offering something to your five senses, but not allowing your sixth sense to come through. So the first thing, how to get that? I think you would, I would advise people who want to do it, because you've got to want to do it, to try and work on some meditation process. Find other people who are doing maybe Hatha Yoga, because actually I didn't tell you this when I was in, in Boston, when I was first working with this uh, experimental theatre company, I got very interested in spirituality and I, I did intensive pr uh, program of Hatha Yoga. And it helped me enormously. It, 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 I had an illuminating experience, actually, which sort of guided me for the rest of my life while I was doing this. <clears throat> but Hatha Yoga has the effect, because it's based on breathing, <clears throat> excuse me, and stretching exercises to calm the body, calm the mind, become centered, become, let yourself move into another world which is not the one you're living in at the moment, let that other world start coming through to you. And to do it, you have to calm your mind. And to calm your mind, you have to, you have to get your body to start telling you, oh, God, I've got an itchy knee, I've got a bad back, I've got a miserable running nose, I've got a headache. And I, I got, you know, you've got to get through all that stuff and calm yourself right down. Otherwise, the sixth sense, <clears throat> the... Fourth dimension, if you like, 
the real me, the real you, the real I will not come through. Once that real I does start to come through, you will be told, you will be guided by your intuition in the step you must then take practically in your life to establish in your life something which fits with your intuitional work. Now, for many people, this will have something to do with health because that is a massive issue in this day and age. And, you know, it's largely selfish in this point in time. <clears throat> it's largely selfish, but health is absolutely vital. So you start saying to yourself, OK, I see God, yeah, I'm eating all the wrong foods. Oh, I shouldn't be stuffing myself with these cheap meats, for instance. I really shouldn't even be shopping in supermarkets because it's junk. It's, it's all five days old. It's, it's lost all its vitamins and its nutrients. And it's coming from the other side of the world. And anyway, it's destroying all the small farmers who once used to produce real food. So why am I doing it? Why am I addicted to the supermarket, all things, you know? Why aren't I supporting local people, local farmers, real food, things with flavor, real energy in the food? And you say, all these issues start coming into one's mind. <clears throat> so one takes these and one says, OK, if I am really serious, and I am, I think, I must take a step in that direction. I must change my diet. I must keep up my Hatha yoga classes because it's helping me enormously clarify what I really need to do, not just what I want to do, what I need to do in order to overcome this downward slope we've been discussing for the last hour and develop my own life, take control of my destiny and work with others. And I like the fact that you said this very much, with others who are on the similar wavelength, because it's a collective issue in the end. We're, we're all connected up, but only certain people are on, on the wavelength of getting beyond the most basic um, bottom line, if you like. And when you've connected up with one or two of those people too, you can then say to yourself, well, let's work together. Let's rent a, a small plot of land or buy it even, or work on someone else's farm. I don't know, anything you like. Let's try and learn the skills of producing our own food. We don't have to become full-time farmers, but let's learn the skills of what's involved in growing our own food. And from that base, you can start taking control of your destiny because it's so fundamental. If you leave food out and you leave water out, you're starting from a base which is already corrupted. You have to go back to absolutely the bottom line. And that is the quality of things you're eating and drinking and the quality of your um, thinking process in taking a positive view looking forward and one way you take control of your destiny. So a long explanation, but I hope it might offer a clue to people who I hope are out there and are in a state of real dilemma, because it's better to be in a state of dilemma than be stuck only in the downward passage. It's better to be in a state of dilemma. That's at least some friction. And then we need that friction. We need lots of friction. That is why I, I guard against what is called new age spirituality. Because there are many people in the world of spirituality who retreat into the background and sit in the lotus position and say, it's nothing to do with me what goes on in the outside world. I'm going to purify myself. Um, if I purify myself, then I'm purifying the world. And I find this very dangerous because although it's nice and it's all part of what we have to try and incorporate into our lives, yes, we should do meditation work. We must do meditation work. We must raise our spiritual level. But the fruits of that must be ploughed into changing society on a practical way. Every single detail of society has to be changed now, from the dark to the, to the light. And that means confronting injustice on a regular basis, not just letting injustice go by and saying, well, I can't do anything about it. We must confront injustice. We must fight for justice. We must hammer our MPs, whatever it is. We must do everything we can with this power that we find in ourselves to save our planet and to bring forward a beautiful future where we all work together 
and understand without the need for rules and regulations what the basic line of commitment to life is and how we joyously will uphold that commitment. So let's leave it at that for now. That was very passionate. Thank you so much, Julian. I think that's going to help a lot of people. And I completely agree. I have said before that I don't really have much time for people who spend all day meditating and retreating inwards. It's not the time in history for that. Jesus did not do that. Even the Buddha did not do that. He went out and he teached. He went out and showed people how to live, you yes. know, how we live properly. So we have to take action and we do have to accept the mantle that's been put down in front of us to push back against everything that's happening. And I think if we do that, then maybe we will reinvite that positive and godly energy back here and that will help us. But we have to help ourselves first. That's free will. But we'll leave it there for part one, Julian. We've got so much more to cover and I don't want to take up all of your time today. So before we leave, Julian, can you just point listeners towards your website so they can find more of your work? So my website is www.julianrose.info. It's all lowercase, of course. And on that website, you will find uh, the information about my books uh, and my articles. Many, many, many. I, I'm, I'm a prolific writer of um, essays, which get, unfortunately nowadays, get quite widely distributed in alternative media and various other things you will find there on that website. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode, Julian, and I look forward to part two. Thank you for having me. What you are basic. Deep, deep down, far, far in, is simply the fabric and structure of existence itself. Peace for all men and women, for all men and women, for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, peace in all time. Honestly expressing yourself. Peace for all men and women, for all men and women, for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, peace in all time. The fabric and structure of existence. Not really peace in our time, peace in all time.